father could put to great use. And I thought to myself, Jonathan, you are now a father. My first year as a father, and I'm very excited about that. Uh, I said, Jonathan, as a father, what would you like? And I just thought about the things that bring me pleasure in life. And so Reese's. Uh, Reese's bring me pleasure. And so we have Reese's Munchers. And these are not just pure Reese's. They have some, uh, some other stuff. There's peanuts in here. Uh, regular peanuts, so they're healthy. Some people are allergic to peanuts. And uh, you like how I said they're healthy there. I just threw that in the midst of the conversation. Probably not, but I'm going to pretend they are when I eat them. And I'm going to pray they turn into, uh, into spinach or something. Uh, Hershey's Waffle Layer Crunch, if you're allergic uh, to peanut butter. Uh, and uh, if you are diabetic and you cannot eat sweets, we have almonds for you. And so out at the front after the service, dads, uh, you grab those. And uh, just, just to be a good steward, I don't want to hand out anything uh, that's not good. So last night, Beth Ann and I tried these, and uh, they're very good. And uh, we, hey, Carl, sit in the sound booth and move the buttons. All right. So, uh, yes, we are very uh, excited about Father's Day. And, man, I, I just do want to say uh, I'm very thankful uh, for Father's. Uh, that uh, step up to the plate and raise their families. And, uh, man, I am very thankful for that. I grew up in a single-parent family, and uh, my mom raised us from eight on, and so I didn't really have a father figure uh, until I was about 15. And then my mom married my stepdad. By that time, I didn't want a dad anymore. Uh, but, man, I am thankful for people uh, that stood in my life and were a parental-type figure to me. And uh, there are probably three or four uh, people on this day that I'll text and I'll say, hey, happy Father's Day. Uh, thank you for being a father figure to me. And thank you for meaning so much to my life. And uh, man, I, I will tell you, uh, this morning, uh, Sadie brought in my uh, Father's Day gift. And uh, Beth Ann said, yes, she ordered it online. <laughs> I'm not real thrilled that Sadie's using the internet at six months. Uh, I wasn't planning on that. I figured she would probably crawl, walk, maybe even speak before she started Googling. Uh, but evidently, Beth Ann uh, got online with Sadie, and or Sadie got online with Beth Ann. And uh, they gave me a knife this morning. And uh, a good knife's always good to have, but this one's special. Uh, this one says, Forever Your Little Girl. And it says, Father's Day 2019. And uh, my entire life, my entire life, I've waited for the day that I'd be able to be a father. I've looked forward since I was a little kid to one day being a father. And this year, we got, uh, I got to be a father to, I think, nine kids <laughs> this year. And we are on uh, number eight and nine right now. We got little Bailey with us, and we've got Amber with us. And uh, I tell you, it is a great, great joy. But as I was thinking about that and thinking about being a father, thinking about this idea of emotions, I'll be really honest with you. There are a lot of things in my life that I said that before I'm a father, I want to get these things under control. Anybody else? You grew up and you thought, man, before I become a father, before I become a mother, before I get married, before whatever it is, before that, I'm going to do this. And so Beth Ann comes last year, and uh, she brings her, uh, yes, it was last year, uh, time fleet is fleeting, and uh, time fleets, time fleets away. Uh, don't think that's a word, but anyway, uh, time is fleeting, and uh, Beth Ann came to me last year, and uh, she sat me down, and she handed me a bag, and in that bag were, uh, I believe it was a Dallas Cowboys pacifier, right? And uh, then uh, a letter just telling me that I was going to be a dad, and I remember sitting there and thinking, yes, finally. And so excited and so blindsided and was not expecting it. But, uh, man, uh, I should have probably been expecting it. Uh, just very excited, very excited. And uh, I, as that year progressed, we get toward the end of the year. Sadie's born in uh, November. And so as we're getting toward uh, Sadie being born, I start thinking about my life and who I am and what I am and I start thinking to myself, am I the guy that I want to raise my daughter? And in some ways, Cindy, uh, the answer to that was no. <laughs> am I the guy I would want my daughter to grow up and marry one day? And in some ways, I thought to myself, no. 
One of those reasons, one of those ways, was an emotion that I've dealt with since I was a little kid, and that's anger. And so as I'm getting ready to bring a little baby in this world, I'm thinking about my emotions, and sometimes I let the emotion of anger uh, lead in my life where it should not lead. And to be very honest with you, this is a message that I don't want to preach. And here's why. Beth Ann's in here right now. And so next time that I get frustrated, she's going to be, I heard this great message one time on anger. You should listen to it. Like, that's swell, Beth Ann. What a, what a great truth. But this will be held against me in courts of law. And I did not, to be honest, I don't love the idea of preaching about this because this is something that I constantly have to battle and constantly have to work at. And before you think I'm just the raging Hulk, I'm not, I'm not like, if you come to our house, there aren't holes in the wall, okay? I'm not talking about that. But I, I, tend, I tend to uh, be more expressive about my emotion. I grew up in a family that was extremely expressive about their emotions and uh, uh, so I tend to be a little bit more expressive, and there are times that I should probably just zip my mouth that I respond. I'm going to tell you about a situation, and uh, so you can think I'm a horrible pastor, and I can preach to you and tell you what the Bible says. I was last year, um, Beth, or I guess it was this year, it was time is fleeting. Uh, Beth Ann and I were in the car, and uh, Ashley Reif was with us. Ashley Amato now. Ashley Amato was with us. And uh, I was on the phone. I got a phone call. It's a pretty important phone call. I'm on the call, and uh, I'm driving. And uh, Beth Ann said, Jonathan, get off the phone. You're going to kill us. Okay? Now, keep in mind, good driver. Never been in a serious accident at all. Uh, we were not in serious danger. Um, and I am pretty awesome. So... <laughs> Very subjective, you're going to kill us there. But, Jonathan, you're going to kill us. And I put up my hand pretty dismissively, uh, pretty agitatedly. Uh, it's important, right? And so um, on this day, Beth Ann and I weren't particularly grooving. And so uh, I got off the phone, and Beth Ann proceeded to tell me uh, how wrong I had been to be on the phone. And, uh, and rightfully so. I should not have been on the phone in that moment, the way I was, whatever. And... She was right, okay? You happy now? You were, no. Uh, and um, we get in a little tiff there, and uh, for a moment, I guess we got kind of forget Ashley's in the car, and so Ashley's just sitting here, like, we're just going back and forth. And Beth Ann said, there's other people in the car you know, and I say, without missing a beat, I wish there were one less. Oh. Yeah, whoops. Yeah, And so not only is Beth Ann rightfully upset with me, but now Ashley thinks I'm basically Satan, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and we've gone through this with, uh, several times. I keep coming up to Ashley. Ashley, do you forgive me yet? And Ashley's like, don't talk to me, Pastor. And Ashley, can we be friends now? Don't talk to me. We used to go over to their house to eat supper. It was great, and now we don't anymore, so... <clears throat> I say that in all teasing, we've made that right, and I apologize to Beth Ann, but here's what happened. I, I got angry, and in a moment, in a moment, I responded in a way I shouldn't have. To be really honest, I can't ever take it back. And so Ashley's perception of me changed, and Beth Ann, Beth Ann's like, I'm glad somebody else sees who you really are. Right? <laughs> but in a moment, I, I said something I shouldn't have said, and said something really that hurt her. To be honest, it was something I didn't mean. I think life would be pretty lonely without Beth Ann in it. But I said it. So as I'm looking at my life and I'm getting ready to be a father and I'm looking at who I am, I look at this idea of this emotion of anger and I say, God, please help me to learn how to control my tongue control the way I think, control what I say, because the truth is decisions made in anger can have permanent effects. This morning, I want to ask you this question, and before you say to yourself, well, Jonathan, I don't need this message. I would have never spoken to Beth Ann that way. Kudos, pat yourself on the back, and then grab yourself by the ear and listen up. 
Because the truth is, all of us at times deal with anger. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we process anger. Some people's personalities, they process it completely differently than other people's personalities. But all of us, all of us deal with anger. And here's why we deal with anger. All of us, all of us have pride. And when our rights are trampled or when our feelings are hurt or when we feel offended, here's what we do. We get, you ready? Angry. And some of us handle it differently, but we all struggle with the emotion of anger. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at it. And uh, to be very honest, the Bible talks a lot about it. Like 200 plus references to anger in the Bible. Matter of fact, if you go to the book of Proverbs, which is one of my favorite books in all the world, you go to Proverbs, and to be very honest, it's just littered throughout that book talking about anger and the angry man and the way we should process anger. And so we're going to look at that this morning. And I'm just going to tell you in advance, it's probably going to step on your toes because it's already stepping on mine. But it's something we need. And it's something that if we're going to be sharpened with the whole counsel of the word of God, we cannot ignore. And so this morning on Father's Day, <laughs> let's look at anger. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Take your Bibles to Proverbs 16 and look in verse number 32. And once you get there, say amen, or you can look on the screen there. <clears throat> I said once you get there, say amen, and it's like amen, 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 amen. I wasn't really thinking about that. I normally say, if you're there, say amen. That could have been awkward for the late bloomer. He gets there two minutes into the service. Amen! Like, I'm finally here. All right, here we go. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 32, He that is slow to anger is, what's the word? Better. better. What's better mean? <laughs> better. <laughs> better than the mighty. Better is its own definition there. And he that ruleth his spirit, then he that taketh a city. Go back to the beginning of the verse, and can we read it aloud together this morning? If you don't have your Bible, it's on the screen. But can we read it together this morning, all together here? Here we go. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit, then he that taketh a city. So all my life, I have wanted to be the best dad I was reading Proverbs one day, and I came across this verse. It says, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And I believe this with all of my heart. I'm never going to be the dad my daughters deserve. I'm never going to be the husband my, wife's my, wife, my wife singular. <laughs> I almost got myself in trouble there. Wife, okay, deserves. I'll not be the pastor that you deserve or the friend that you deserve. If I allow anger to have a significant role in my life. So this morning, I want to talk to you about that idea of anger. And I want you to focus in on that first part of the verse. He that's slow to anger is better than the mighty. Someone who can control their anger is stronger than the mighty. Let's pray, and we're going to jump into our text. Father, we love you, and uh, it is honestly humiliating to put my faults on display, but I understand that I am broken. And so, Father, I pray that you'd speak through my brokenness, and Father, I pray that you'd forgive me where I've failed you. I pray that I would be your mouthpiece from your word, and that, Father, you would speak to our hearts. And Father, however we manifest anger in our lives, I pray that you would challenge us and convict us that acting on our anger can have devastating, permanent ramifications. Father, I pray that you'd speak to us. I pray that you would get into the root of our heart and do in our hearts exactly what you'd want to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I read this story. Two guys are talking about anger one night. And the one guy said, I'll show you the difference in anger, types of anger. So at 1 a.m., he goes to the phone, he dials a number. He says, is Jones there? The man says, no. <laughs> he 
he hangs up the phone. So the men continue until the same guy says, now I'm going to show you frustration. And so at 2 a.m., he goes to the phone, he dials the same number. The man picks up, he says, what? The guy says, hey, is Jones there? <laughs> He's frustrated. He says, no! Hangs up the phone. At 3 a.m., the guy says, now I'm going to show you rage. He returns the phone, dials the same number. A third time, he says, hey, I'm Jones. Have I gotten any calls tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the guy was pretty angry. People do crazy things when they lose their tempers. Have you ever seen a toddler throw a temper tantrum? <laughs> Beth, Ann, Beth Ann came into uh, to the bedroom this morning. She had gotten up and Sadie was throwing a fit. I guess it's what, three, Beth Ann's gone. She gone. Uh, she can't hold it against me. This is great. Um, that was funny. Three o'clock in the morning, Beth Ann comes back to the bed. And uh, she had gotten up because Sadie's throwing a fit. We're trying to work on sleep training and things like that. And uh, she said, Jonathan, she's throwing a fit. And I said, really, what's she doing? And uh, so since it's dark, I couldn't really see. So she said, here, fill my leg. And she proceeds to, like, kick her leg as Sadie was doing. And Sadie is just throwing a fit. Very real uh, definition there, description of what was going on. Uh, even a blind man could see it. It was awesome. And uh, she is, uh, Sadie can throw a major fit. Yesterday I got on Facebook, and uh, there was a guy that I know that was at uh, Walmart in Pinellas Park, and there was a guy that lost his mind in the middle of Walmart. He starts going down the aisle and just throwing everything on the ground and yelling and screaming and stuff. People do crazy things <laughs> when they get angry. Have you seen the guy driving down the street that yesterday, or uh, Three days ago, I am driving down up by Largo Mall, and uh, there is a guy in the car next to me, and there is a guy behind him, and this guy is just yelling. And so, like, I look over, and he, like, opens his door. He sticks his head out, sticks a finger out, and <laughs> gets back in the car. And the guy behind him is, like, this guy behind him should be my grandpa. Like, he's 85 years old. And he is red. I mean, losing his mind because this guy merged into his lane. And I mean, these two are about to come to blows at the stoplight. Anger makes you do stupid stuff. And this morning, I want to take a look at anger. First of all, I want to look at this. I want to look at the root of anger. Root of anger. Anger is a, a secondary emotion. It's normally uh, triggered by something else. We're not born angry. Uh, something typically happens to ignite it. Anger is a choice that we make based on a feeling that we feel. And uh, it can become a habitual type of things, but here's some triggers to emotion as I was thinking about this. Uh, this is not original to me, by the way, this uh, acronym here, uh, if you will, uh, but anger. Anger is uh, often triggered by anxiety or fear. So when people are anxious about something, it tends to put them on edge and they allow worry and fear to overtake them and they are just like, one sentence away from exploding, right? Anxiety. Anxiety, uh, at its basis form, reveals what we think and understand about God. Truth is that God promises to supply our, all our needs according to his riches and glory in Philippians 4. He promises in Hebrews 13 that he'll never leave us or forsake us. Based on those two things, that he'll supply all my needs and he'll never leave me, I can be pretty calm. I can rest pretty easy because that tells me this that tells me god is always there and he's always got my back are you with me Amen. and yet we get anxious and fearful the bible tells us in philippians 4 6 and 7 to be careful be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto god and the peace of god which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Uh, anxiety, this, uh, I hope you can grab onto this. Anxiety should not trigger anger. It should trigger trust. Anxiety should not trigger anger. It should trigger trust. Next time you get fearful, anxious, I wonder what's going to happen. Uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen here. And I'm just a, don't, don't, don't push me because anxious Hey, listen, can I tell you, next time you get there, don't let that become anger. Take a step back. Take a breath. As Philippians 4, 6 says, hey, talk to your father. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, everything. How many things? 
everything by prayer and supplication. What are you saying? Quit worrying. Talk to Jesus. But Jonathan, you don't know what I'm dealing with. Here's what I know. God told us to take everything to him. Well, Jonathan, you don't understand the pressure I'm under. Uh, I understand this. He said, take everything to him. Nothing's too great for him. Nothing's too hard for him. The second thing there, a nuisance or frustration, a, a trigger. This is when things don't go as planned. We get flustered and frustrated, uh, frustrated, right? Uh, because, because we are frustrated. And, and instead of adjusting and, and dealing with it, we, we explode. And it doesn't matter if it's a work issue or a spouse issue, a kid issue. Frustration gets the best of us. And we feel compelled to respond in anger. Any of you get frustrated? Yeah? Uh, I don't know about you guys. Like, my pet peeve is being late. Like, I, I hate it. I hate it with a passion. And now we have a lot of hobbits in our house. And so being on time is an illusion. And uh, this morning, like, I wanted desperately to be on time. I'm like, you know, some of our music team's not here, and some people are out of town, got to fill in the gaps, and, man, I, I got to be there, and, and this morning, it's time to go, and <laughs> we're not ready to go. And so we leave, I don't know, 10 minutes later, something like that, and I'm just frustrated. I don't say a, I don't say a word. I just, I'm sitting there, and I'm fuming. <laughs> I'm just so frustrated. And we get to the stop sign at the end of our road to pull onto Seminole Boulevard. And by the way, I'm preaching on anger this morning, and frustration is one of my points. And here's what happens. Jonathan, I'm so sorry that we're late. And I just go. I didn't really say anything, but I thought a lot of stuff. I'm frustrated. And, and I'm coming into church, and I'm going to preach to you about anger. And, and I've conquered anger since yesterday, and then I blow it again, right? That frustration, if we're not careful, it leads to anger. How many times do we get frustrated and something small just triggers us and sets us off and, and, and we just respond? Anger, and we say something we cannot take back. Grief, G, grief, pain. Whether it's physical or emotional or social, we would rather be angry at someone or something than be in pain. Are you with me? You ever been around that person that whenever they start feeling bad, they just turn into the devil, right? And, and they're not, <laughs> somebody whose wife is not here this morning was like, yes, um, that's fantastic. You wouldn't have done that. She was sitting next to you. Uh, man, you have a pain coming and it's emotional, physical, whatever, and you just, <sighs> why? Because you're feeling pain. And so you want to inflict or project that pain on somebody else so that they can feel what you're feeling, right? It's human. People do it. It happens. I think we all at times do it. Embarrassment, humiliation. Nobody likes being made fun of or being laughed at. Nobody enjoys being made a fool or the butt of a joke. And no matter how much we try to laugh things off, we don't ha enjoy having other people laugh at our expense. And so maybe we're laughing on the outside when that person made the 15th witty comment. But on the inside, we want to, like, do some bad things to people, <laughs> right? And just humiliated. You're, can I give you another one? Resentment, animosity. Resentment is pent up animosity towards somebody. Maybe they've said something or they did something that resulted in loss. The trigger is very simple. Someone harms me, and so I'm going to get them back. Right? They have wounded me, and now I'm out to get them. All bets are off. And the old adage, the idea is, I am going to do unto others before they do it again to me. <laughs> right? No matter the trigger, we must all realize that our anger can have devastating consequences. No matter how we rationalize it, you say, well, I grew up in an angry household. Well, I grew up, I'm just, I'm Irish, <laughs> right? Are Irish people angry? I think Irish, yes. Any Irish people here? Are you an angry person? Um, Italians. Those are the angry ones right there. 
I'm about to offend entire people groups, and I have no clue what I'm saying here. No matter how we rationalize it, anger is real. You've got to own it. And so I want to look at the reality of anger. What is reality? What's the reality? What does it produce? And let me just say this. It's fruitless. It's fruitless to be angry. The Bible says in Psalm 37, 8, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. If you have a pen, I'm going to give you about 10, 15 verses throughout the rest of this message. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Would you write them down, the references? Just write the reference down. Later on this week, would you go back and do some homework? Would you take a look at these verses and see that God cares enough about this emotion, that he talks quite a bit about it, and he's pretty specific about it. Psalm 37, 8. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. In other words, losing your cool doesn't make things better. It's fruitless. Ben Franklin said this, whatever begins in anger ends in shame. Whatever begins in anger ends in shame. And that's why James, speaking to that first church there, that scattered church, that, that very uh, young, childlike church, he says in James 1, 19 and 20, Wherefore, my beloved brev- brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. You ready? Slow to wrath. He says, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Can I pause for just a moment? Here's what he said. Your being angry is not going to produce the desired results that you're looking for. Well, what does that mean? Let's talk about that for a moment. These scattered Christians are being persecuted for their faith. Later on, Nero will burn down a city and blame it on Christians. These people are being just completely trampled underfoot. They are looked at as the scourge, the dirt of society. They are being persecuted. And you know what? They're being persecuted wrongly. I don't know about you, but when I'm persecuted, I have a really hard time with it. But especially when I'm persecuted wrongly. Are you following me? When I was growing up, when we were kids, uh, there were five of us. And mom would be doing something. And we would get in a fight. Uh, I should say one of my sisters would start a fight. And mom would come in and she'd say, what happened? And my sisters would clam up. And so mom would say, well, if nobody's going to own up to it, everybody's in trouble. And so she'd line us up on this couch that was just uh, wide enough for all of us to line up side to side. And she introduced something to our fannies that did not feel good. And she would spank down the whole line. And I remember being persecuted wrongly, (laughs) right? Doesn't feel good, does it? And here's these Christians at this first church, and they could be upset. They could be incensed because they're being treated uh, not just poorly, wrongly. But here he says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You're not going to accomplish by anger what can only be done through the right response. I look at people that have made impacts on this world. And I look at people who, when they were persecuted, they did not respond with anger. Anger. Are you following me? Here's a sublime example of that. Christ himself. When he was persecuted, he went, open not his mouth. As a lamb stood before his shears is dumb. Open not his mouth. You say, well, Jonathan, uh, not everybody is angry. This, this doesn't apply to me. I am, I am calm. I am composed. Uh, Drive around with me for three hours in Florida, and you will not be calm and composed uh, because there are some angry elves in Florida, right? You add snowbirds, you add Canadians, and you add in uh, just the normal Floridians, and you have a messed up traffic situation here, and you drive in it enough, it'll drive anybody crazy. We all get angry at times. Some of us have different approaches. I, I saw this the other day. I thought it was pretty neat. A toxic waste approach. Toxic waste people, they bury anger deep within, but they present an A-OK outward appearance. But the problem is that over the years, you take enough of that in and you get angry enough inside, it begins to leak out and contaminate those around you. You ever been around somebody like that? We're outwardly angry, but they just became so resentful and bitter that you get around them and you feel like you got to go home and take a shower, right? Toxic waste. The volcano approach. 
these people talk and they rumble for years, but they get to the point where they finally say, I'm not going to take this anymore, and they explode, right? The volcano approach. The snow cone approach. Snow cone people go silent. They just put you on the ice. You ever been around somebody that when they get angry, they just shut up? Yeah. Those people drive me. <laughs> Some people are pointing right now. You've you got to go home with that person. A microwave approach. Microwave people confront the situation that bothers them with an instantaneous response. You don't even hear the beep, beep, beep. You just, bam, right? Anger. The truth is, each of us may, based on our personality, deal with uh, different things a different way. But here's the deal. We all struggle with anger. We all struggle with anger. The movie Forrest Gump. <laughs> There's a scene where Jenny returns back to her home, Jen A. And her father, abusive father, he had died. And the, uh, the farmhouse there is dilapidated, it's abandoned. And she begins to reflect on the abuse she endured as a child. She just gets angry, overcome with rage. rage. And she begins to pick up rocks and just throw them as hard as she can at the house. She throws rocks and throws rocks and throws rocks, and finally she falls to the ground. She's just completely exhausted because she's exerted all this energy throwing these rocks at this house because of all the rage that she felt. And as that scene closes, Forrest just gives us a little bit of wisdom there. Sometimes there just aren't enough rocks, right? And the truth is we live life and we deal with anger and we, we take it in, and sometimes we just let it out, but the truth is letting out your anger isn't going to make you feel better the way you think it will. Mishandled anger is futile. And if we don't learn, listen to me please, if we don't learn to manage it, it will manage us. If you don't learn how to manage it, it will manage you. You say, Jonathan, this just doesn't, it's kind of awkward, kind of weird message for Father's Day. I'm looking out at a room of people and I know your stories, and I know your life, and I know what one decision made in anger cost your family. And I know what one decision made in anger, and one statement made in anger, and one mistake made in anger cost. Are you following what I'm saying? It's very real. Very real. Very dangerous. It's, <clears throat> it is a uh, fruitless thing, reality of anger. It's fruitless. It's it's foolish. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 29, He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Proverbs 14, 17 says, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. It's like fortune cookie, uh, little tidbits of wisdom from Proverbs right here, right? He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. Anger defines a fool as it demonstrates this. It demonstrates who's actually in control of me. But can I tell you that not just is it foolish, not just is it foolish, or I'm sorry, foolish and fruitless, it's also forbidden. The Bible tells us in Colossians 3, now put ye off all of these anger, malice, wrath, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. In other words, it means this. It means to rid yourself of something. To, to put it off to the side. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, uh, I cut our grass, and it was very hot outside, and I got very nasty. Because when I mow grass, I want you to be able to tell that I mowed the grass. Because I want Beth Ann to be really appreciative that I did it. So I mow the grass, and I lay on the ground, and I wallow around in it. I get on my face and get some dirt and stuff, and go inside, and I'm filthy. And Beth Ann says, you better not come in the house like that. And I say, job done. She realizes I'm dirty. Yeah. And here's what she says. She says, take those clothes and get them out of here. Take those clothes off. And here's, here's the idea. She tells me to rid myself of it. Why? Because it's contaminated. The Bible tells us to put off wrath. Put off anger. Put off, are you following what I'm saying? There's no place for it. Will Rogers said, people who fly into a rage seldom make a safe landing. Here's what happens when you fly off the handle. Three things you say and do, foolish things that you're going to regret later. 
You do things that cause problems for others. You do things that have a hefty penalty. Think about a situation that our church has faced this year, thinking about a decision made in anger. And all of those things are so true. You say and do foolish things, you'll regret later. You, you do things that cause immense problems for other people. You do things that have a hefty, can I say an eternal penalty. So the Bible tells us where to get rid of them. Anger is to be abandoned by believers. Why? Because when anger is taken personally, it's acted upon, it becomes sin. When you're angry, you're no longer under God's control. You're not under the control of the spirit. You're under the control of the flesh. And that is sin. So Jonathan, you've told us how it's wrong. And we got it from the beginning when you told us about what you did in the car. We knew you were wrong. We understand anger is sin. Well, we all agree that we should not be angry. But the Bible tells us the remedy to anger. I believe we see a few more things in the Proverbs. We should commit to control our anger. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 11, the Bible says this, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. Proverbs 16, 32, we read that earlier, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. You know what that verse tells me? Anger not only should not control me, but anger doesn't have to control me. That idea in verse number 32, the second part of that verse in Proverbs 16, it says, He that ruleth his spirit. What are you saying? I'm saying you can control your anger. You can control your anger. But Jonathan, you don't know how I was raised. You can control your anger. But Jonathan, you don't understand my background. This is just what my people do. No, 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 no. You can control your anger. You can rule your spirit. And sometimes it takes more strength and courage to control our emotions than it does to capture a fortified city. How do we do that? Well, number one, you've got to start by admitting your tendency to take our anger to another level. You, gotta, you ready? You've got to admit you've got a problem. <laughs> you know what I did when I was looking at my life last year? I saw the way I handled some situations and the shortness and the just abruptness in which I handled some situations and just some things that I, in my life I was angry about and I hadn't dealt with. You know, the first thing I did was I said, you know what, I've got a problem. I got on Amazon and started getting books on anger, books on dealing with bitterness, books on forgiveness. And I had thought, man, I, I'm, I've forgiven people. I'm not bitter about this anymore. I've, I've let this go. But deep inside of me, there was some things that I had to work through. But you don't work through them until you admit you've got a problem. Some of you just need to fess up and say, hey, listen, I've got an issue here. And secondly, confess your need for accountability. There are some people in my life that I go to and I say, hey, man, I'm having a bad week right now. I'm having a bad week. I need some counsel. Need some advice. And typically it's the same thing. I know what to do. I could give the counsel myself. But sometimes having somebody else that you led into your life that is able to speak truth into your life, man, that's a helpful, helpful thing. Thirdly, target the situation and not the person. What do you say? The things that make you angry, don't allow yourself to be, let's say you're upset about something. You're, you're right in being upset. Can I tell you, you, you've got to let that stop at the situation and not dump that on the person. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, what's that look like? Fast food. Fast food. At McDonald's the other day, uh, I wasn't eating there. Of course, I was eating a salad at home, but Beth Ann wanted me to get something. So. <laughs> That's a whole lie. And uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I'd ordered it, and I've gotten to where, like, fast food is not fast enough, so I do the mobile pickup. And I, I pull in to the, some of you, I pull in the mobile pickup, and I can park and check my email and stuff. So it's great, because I just sit there, and they bring my food to me. It's awesome. So I'm sitting there, and uh, I order my food very deliberately. And um, the guy brings out my food, and he's missing a drink. And I said, sir... Uh, I think there were supposed to be two of these. And he said, no, I'm pretty sure that's right. And I'm thinking, first of all, I am very well acquainted with this order because this is my order. You deal with hundreds of orders throughout the day. I don't expect you to personally remember everyone, but I am familiar with mine, and I'm pretty sure that I did. 
Order two drinks. And so this guy walked away, and he's going in to check his computer because I'm pretty sure I didn't mess it up. And I'm just... It wasn't so much he missed the drink. It was the fact that when I pointed out the thing, he said, no, I didn't. And I'm like, oh, it made, it made me mad. And it shouldn't have. It should have been a small. It was a $1 drink. It was silly. But it made me upset. And, and here's what I did. It was a mistake that was made. And I took my frustration about not getting my drink, and I almost took it out on him. But then I remembered last year, I've told you guys this story last year, there was a guy at a hotel that was trying to get a room for one of our speakers. And I called him, and he didn't treat me the way I thought he should. And so I treated him poorly. And I said, well, I don't need your hotel. And I hung up. And I called 25 other hotels in Pinellas County, and there were no rooms. <laughs> and so I called him back and said, remember the time I told you I didn't need you? <laughs> well, I do need you now. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to eat crow. And here's what's worse. I had to go in and take him a form. So I couldn't just do this on the phone. So I had to walk in, and I had to say, I'm Jonathan. <laughs> and Jonathan, what is your occupation? <laughs> oh. Pastor. I'm sorry, what was that? Pastor. Uh, I'm sorry, I just said, I'm a pastor, okay? <laughs> what are you saying? Take a situation and you take it out on a person? You ever do that? Take your frustration and just dump on somebody? That's what anger does. <clears throat> anger, first of all, we've got to understand we can control it. Can I give you the second thought? Would you consider the consequences of it? Would you consider the consequences of it? I, I tend, my personality, I, 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 I tend to kind of take things in and take things in and take things in and take things in. But at some point, like, I'm like, okay, listen, I'm not going to take in anymore. And so I just deal like the widow maker, right? It's like, comment, 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 comment. And this is not Beth Ann. This is all the other people in my neighborhood <laughs> comment, 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 comment. You know what? If you want to keep dishing out comments, here you go. Bam! Drop the mic. What's up? <laughs> and when the other person runs away crying because you were a complete idiot, you have taken something that never had to go there. And now you are going to have a consequence that should have never happened. And that's a, silly illustra that's a silly illustration that we can probably, a lot of us can relate to, right? But the truth is it's magnified so much further when you let your anger be unchecked and it goes and goes and goes and goes. Here's what happens. Devastating consequences. You say, well, it's, it's not that big of a deal. It's kind of, I like my men a little bit. I like my women a little bit sassy, whatever. It's, it's not cute. It, it's not okay. It's not funny when you cannot control your spirit. Consider the consequences. Can I tell you that whenever we're angry, that's the time that we have to learn to clearly communicate. What's that mean? Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. You know what helped me the most, the helped me the most in my life with dealing with my anger? was when that beautiful woman right there, I will say something I should not say or I'll handle something. Mine tends to be, my anger tends to be frustration that I just let out. That's, that's how I typically, my stuff is. I'm frustrated about something and I just let it out. And when she started dealing with that with a soft answer and she started responding gracefully when I would respond angrily, here's what that did. It convicted me. It convicted me. And I began to see the way she would handle things well, and I handled things poorly. And here's what it, a soft answer began to turn away wrath. And so Jonathan's hulking it. And she handles it well. And suddenly it's like somebody just stuck a pin in it. That's deflation, by the way. <laughs> Come to a clo close here. C communicate anger, anger properly. Think before you speak. 
The Bible says, he that keepeth his mouth keepeth, keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. You ready for this? Don't speak out when you're angry. Just hold it in. Just keep, you say, hold it in and I'm just going to blow up. No, no, no. Hold it in. Deal with that. Talk to the Lord about that. Deal with it with somebody that can actually help you. Can I give you one more thing that I think would help a lot of you? And then we're going to close here. You need to choose some quality company. Jonathan, what are you talking about? The Bible says this in Proverbs 22. Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man thou shalt not go. Oh, 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 what, what are you talking about? Proverbs 19 says this. A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. If you hang out with angry people, I'm just telling you, you're probably going to become angry. Because anger is contagious. Anger, anger is cancerous. And some of you, some of you, we have this tendency, we'll hang around with certain people, and maybe it's not like outright anger, like hacking somebody with a machete kind of anger, but it's just like constant drama. Constant, like, are you following what I'm saying? And you get around them, and, and you just listen to them, and they're so negative, and they're so critical, and, and you're just sitting there, and it's that toxic waste kind of anger that's just seeping out, and it's just getting all over you, and then you, you just, right? Some of you, our workplaces are like that, or maybe a family situation like that. Here's the idea. Make no friendship with an angry man. If there's somebody in your life that cannot control their attitude, you need to pull away from that person. Why? Because their anger is toxic. Now, I want to I I say this, and I want you to understand me very clearly. Say, well, my spouse, they're constantly getting upset. You should, you should watch them whenever I overcook the ramen noodles, right? Listen, I'm not saying you should leave your spouse, okay? You got to work through things. Now, that, there's no place for abuse. There's no place for... Listen, I'm not condoning that. Okay? But I'm saying you need to work through things. But I'm talking about voluntary relationships. If Brad and I get real close, and I suddenly discover that Brad is like this crazy man that just has nothing but negativity and anger or whatever, I'm just telling you, we're not going to be that close anymore. Because I don't need that influence in my life. Are you following what I'm saying? Here, here's why. I need to be led by the Spirit of God, not by Brad. I, I need to be able to submit to and listen to the Spirit of God, and sometimes I can't hear because of all the clamor coming from Brad. Some of you are in toxic environments, and you wonder why you don't have a walk with the Lord. It's because everything else is squeezing that out. Everything else is quenching that. Quenching it. So, Jonathan, what's the conclusion? You have some control over your anger. But if you do not control your anger, it will control you. And it will devastate those around you. Here's why I wanted to check it while it was still this. Right? Right? Here's why I wanted to check it. Because I don't want my daughter growing up and seeing a different dad than what she's grown up with. Are you following what I'm saying? Because I don't want one moment of anger to define who I am. I don't, want, I don't want me messing up in front of you to determine in your mind who I am. And, and I can't risk. I can't. In the history of our church, there is one conversation that stands out to me that I had and I responded, and I felt like it was a righteous anger. I felt like I just needed to fix this problem, and I did not handle it with grace, and I did not handle it with goodness, and I responded just to be very bluntly, angrily. And it haunts me. One conversation in three and a half years, and it devastates me. Because I wasn't led by the Spirit in that moment. I was led by my feelings my emotions, and that trigger set me off, and I anger. You 
can't take it back. So here's my challenge to you. Whether it's in a small detail here, whether you're a, a volcano or a microwave or, or a toxic waste dump. So what did you learn today? Well, my pastor said, I'm a toxic waste dump. Well, you should try my church. He's nice there. <laughs> hey, hey, whatever your situation is, would you look and say, listen, this has no place in my life. As a child of God, this does not belong here. It's not okay. Would you deal with it? Would you stand to your feet with your heads bowed, your eyes closed? If you'd say, Jonathan, I understand that anger is a troublesome emotion. It is a destroyer. And the Lord's spoken to my heart about that. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to use you as a sermon illustration. If you'd say, Jonathan, the Lord's spoken to my heart about this idea of anger. And there's some stuff I need to talk to him about. Would you slip your hand up there where you are? All around the room, all around the room, all around the room. You can put your hands down. Here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to give you some time to respond to the Lord. His word, I gave you his word as best as I could. And to be honest with you, now that I'm done preaching and listening to what it, <laughs> what it was, I need to do some business with him. And so what I'd encourage you to do is however the Lord's spoken to your heart, maybe you need to come to the altar. Maybe you need somebody to pray with. Maybe you want to pray there in your seat. But for a few minutes here, as Stephen is playing, would you spend some time in prayer with the Lord and do business with him however he's spoken to your heart? And the altar is open. Dear Lord, we're going to spend some time here in prayer, and I pray that you'd hear our prayers. Pray that you would take our intent and I pray that you'd help us to put some action behind it. Pray that we not let anger control us, but that we would keep it under control through your power, through your spirit. We thank you for this challenge from your word. And I pray that you'd speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. You deal with the Lord as he deals with you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.